Pittoresco Festival Ake Dikea. Hi, good evening. Thank you for joining us again for this second event looking at the representation of Romanian Sinti women in early and silent cinema. During our last meeting, we uh, focused on specific on-screen female archetypes such as the fortune teller, the exotic dancer and the Romani femme fatale. We saw that certain stereotypical images of Romanian Sinti women that uh, still appear in contemporary media were in fact present from the very beginning of film history and partly came to be inscribed in the popular imagination through uh, the medium of film. So if you missed that first presentation, it is available on YouTube. So if you're interested, uh, I would invite you to check that online. We will continue our exploration today and this time we will examine the representation of Romanian Sinti women as a social danger, uh, disrupting the stable locations of white identity and therefore posing a threat to the white bourgeois moral standards of early 20th century societies. You probably won't be surprised to hear that the first film industries in Europe and North America were largely dominated by white male filmmakers and catering to a predominantly white audience. From the beginning, the depictions of ethnic minorities on screen revolved uh, around the creation of a them versus us effect. This is not specific to Roma people, you know, cinema was born at the end of the 19th century, at a time when uh, colonial ideology was at its peak. The belief that the cultural values of white Europeans were inherently superior was disseminated through cultural productions. So the aim of most of these early films was not to offer an authentic or at least objective representation of minority cultures and traditions, but to produce otherness and to project various ideological concepts on those portrayed as others. So when we look for images of Roma people in early cinema, we shouldn't expect to find a portrayal of the everyday life and challenges of Romani communities in the early 20th century. Hidden behind the stereotypes that irks us so much, we will in fact find a projection of the fantasies and the fears of the film pioneers and through them of the society of the time. In our last session, we discussed how Romanian Sinti women were at the same time portrayed as uh, desirable, yet often frightening. This is something that is reflected in the way Romanian Sinti female characters are often hypersexualized, yet at the same time portrayed as unfeminine. In the popular culture of the time, Romani women came to be placed as the opposite of respectable white femininity. The ideal Victorian woman was indeed uh, pure, chaste, refined and modest. Romanian Sinti women on screen, on the other hand, were often represented smoking, laying on the grass, speaking with the mouthful, spitting on the ground, etc. Behaviors that were often emphasized to remind the audience of the assumed incompatibility of Roma people with the dominant society. A recurring aesthetic choice made by many filmmakers at the time was the use of blackface on white performers playing non-white characters to emphasize again otherness but also to create a visual opposite. 
Uh, we know that the practice of blackface gained popularity during the 19th century in the United States, where it was mainly used to portray in a very stereotypical way people of African descent. Uh, we also have a few examples of Romanian characters on screen who are played by white actors and actresses using blackface. The reason I'm underlining this is because I want to stress how much Romanian sensitive women in these films were almost constantly denigrated and portrayed negatively. A dark complexion wasn't perceived at the time as a positive feature, and especially on a woman, so anything to underline the differences between white femininity and fantasized, demonized Romani femininity was useful to remind the audience that Romanian Sinti women uh, just like any I'm saying, non-white women were not respectable ladies and could anyway uh, not be trusted. Two on-screen figures come to mind to exemplify this further, the spy and the vengeful woman. It's not rare to find Romani spies in early cinema, and there are two main reasons for this. First of all, the traditional nomadic lifestyle of Roma, an ability to move from one place and even one country to the other, has for long instigated distrust among the gaji. The 19th century saw the emergence of nationalism as an ideology, and Roma did not fit into that in the positions of others within the nation. And because of what they also embody, uh, idleness, eroticism, exoticism, Romani women made for perfect cinematic spies. Uh, and the figure of the vengeful woman emphasizes this as well. Let's take a closer look at this early D.W. Griffith's work, An Awful Moment. In the film, a courtroom is disturbed by a Romani woman who vehemently protests a judge's final decision. We do not know exactly what the verdict was and if the woman is right to perhaps speak out in the face of injustice, but the filmmaker seems to tell us that it doesn't really matter. The woman is portrayed as unruly, she doesn't follow orders and eventually has to be physically removed from the courtroom by courts. As the judge, who symbolizes justice and righteousness, returns home to his loving wife and child, the Romani woman plus her revenge. Everything in her behavior leads the audience to believe that she is uncivilized. She is a disturbance to the laws established by society. Look at the way she climbs the balcony of the judge's house, like a thief, but also perhaps like an animal uh, would do. She is portrayed as this evil presence that threatens a peaceful and loving, respectable household. On the other hand, the character of the judge's wife is a frail, obedient, motherly, sensible woman who, of course, becomes the victim of our Romani reign. Whether it is through their unfeminine features, their role as spies, or their never-ending desire for revenge, Romani female characters always embody this threat to the bourgeois moral standards of early 20th century societies. Uh, prudishness, sexual restraint, individualism, responsibility. Romani women appear as untamable women. On screen, they never belong to the domestic sphere, they don't fulfill their contract as respectable mothers and wives, they live in large communities, don't seem to be interested in the model of the nuclear family, and are portrayed as promiscuous and expressing their sexual desires. They are also too independent and mobile to be trusted. Did you know that women's physical activity was a cause of concern at the highest levels of academic research during the Victorian era? 
These things were slowly changing um, in the first half of the 20th century, but the women who challenged gender norms and structures at the time were also seen as controversial and as threats to the social order. Funnily enough, suffragettes and early feminists were often characterized as bohemians, you know, a word that was commonly used to describe the Rom Romanian Sinti women. So Romani female characters in these early films often mirror not only the fantasies, but also the deepest fears of those who control society at that time. One way to symbolically respond to the constant threat that Romani and Sinti female characters pose in these early films um, is actually to kill them, erase them from the narrative altogether. Indeed, Romanian Sinti women are often doomed to a tragic fate in early and silent cinema. I want to stop a minute on a German film, Aber Glaube, also known under the title Superstition in English, starring Austrian actress Ellen Richter as Milica, a young Romani woman who uh, flees the circus in which she was employed after two of her suitors fought to death for her. Unfortunately, I cannot show you any footage of the film, but I want to share the review that a film critic uh, from the French magazine La Cinématographie Française gave of Abba Globe in September 1920. The article explains that after the fight, Militza seeks refuge in the presbytery of a small and peaceful village. She is welcomed by a young priest who lives there with his mother. It appears that not so long after that, the priest falls in love with Militza and subsequently is hit by lightning and dies. The priest's mother throws Militza out, believing that this was her fault. It is said in the review that, I quote, everywhere she went, uh, she ignited a desire brutally extinguished by tragic events, unquote. So here again, we have an example of a Romani femme fatale who poses a very uh, distinct and physical threat to society. Milica seems to involuntarily seduce every man she encounters, and because she supposedly uh, carries some sort of curse with her, she leads them to their death. Milica embodies this social threat. She is that stranger who comes in peaceful, trouble-free villages where nice, honest families live, and she lures the men with her intoxicating beauty. So the only option for the filmmaker in order to restore the symbolic order seems to eliminate Milica from the story. In the film, she is eventually chased by the villagers, uh, led by the priest's mother who embodies, you know, this time righteousness and rebellion against social disorder. And uh, Milica is stoned to death. And that's the end of the film. I could find a few examples of Roma people being chased by mobs of angry gadgets in other films, and I always find these scenes to be extremely disturbing. But the entire narrative of Abba Globe, that choice of ending, and knowing that the French critics actually enjoyed the film and offered a very positive review, can give us a hint at the negative impact that these types of narratives may have had and the lack of safety Romanian Sinti women most probably experienced at the time, partly due to the normalization of violence against them that cinema so easily produced.
However, the most unsafe environment for Romanian Sinti women in early films is surprisingly not among gadget people, but is often thought to be within their own families and communities. This portrayal of um, the Romani woman as an oppressed victim goes hand in hand with uh, the representation of Romani violent masculinity, which in turn contrasts with the figure of the Gadjo savior. As we already saw, Romani women embody this sort of ideological battlefield between white bourgeois ethics and the seemingly disorganized and threatening lifestyle and culture of the Roma, who are largely depicted as lazy, dirty, immoral, and often violent criminals. It seems that Romani female characters um, are only given two options, either to die tragically or to accept to be saved, which is in fact synonymous with accepting to letting go of the community, culture, and way of living. In other words, what is expected of the other is complete assimilation, deculturation. On screen, it really appears that the white, civilized, righteous world of the Gaji, embodied by the non roma hero, is on a mission to rescue all the poor souls who got lost on a wrong racial path. Once she is saved by her knight in shining armor, the Romani victim enters a new world. She usually settles in a beautiful house, becomes a respectable wife, sometimes even with employees at her service. She is all cleaned up and trades her old rags for beautiful gowns and glamorous accessories. The Swedish film Madame de Teb is another interesting example here. In the film, a young Romani girl, Ayla, is cursed by her father because she had a child with a non-Roma. Expelled from the community, she abandons her baby to a baroness and leaves. 35 years later, Ayla has become a renowned fortune teller and, uh, I quote from the film, her distinguished lady sought after by the ladies of the aristocracy and politicians of all parties. It is only through her forced disengagement with her community that Ayla was able to become accepted within the dominant society of the Gaji. But the power that she holds as a fortune teller will eventually lead her to become imprisoned. And when she is reunited with her son, who has himself become a prominent politician, she is so ashamed that the guilt kills her. Hyla's transformation couldn't be complete. At the end of the film, she lives in an elegant flat, phrase with the aristocracy, dresses like a respectable lady, but because uh, she kept a part of a native culture, her presence within the gadget world could not symbolically be accepted. But one of the best ways for Romani women to find a happy ending is actually not to be Roma after all. We have countless examples of film narratives where the heroine turns out to be a gadget woman who was abducted at birth, or given away by her parents for various reasons uh, to a group of Roma travelers, and later, we're finding out her real origins, can safely return to the safety and privileges that rightly belong to her, or so it is presented. It is hard to break stereotypes that have been engraved in people's minds for so long. Uh, but one way to resist dehumanizing and negative images is to redefine one's reality and to produce counter-narratives. 
This has not been an easy process for Roma and Sinti people who have historically been placed at the margins of the film industry, but that doesn't mean that they haven't contributed to the development of early cinema from its very beginning. In its early stages, cinema was predominantly presented to the general public as a fairground attraction, and the role of Roma travelers soon became significant in the dissemination of this new art form. We know that French Roma, for example, acted as the first film distributors, projectionists, and musical accompanists. Up to the early uh, 1910s, films were a popular entertainment, screened under a tent, usually attracting a working class audience. Cinema wasn't then necessarily part of what is known as high culture. In his memoirs, the late French Manouche activist Raymond Gurem revisits his childhood memories in his family's circus and traveling cinema. Uh, this is a precious testimony that can enlighten us on the role of Roma people behind the silver screen. For example, Raymond Gurem explains that a lot of people within the audience did not know how to read, so his father would often read and act out the dialogues uh, while projecting the film at the same time. Less fun but necessary was the task of rewinding the film, which was the responsibility of the children, if, uh, even if sometimes it lasted well into the night. Cinema was an integral part of Renault's life, uh, as a source of income for the family, but also as an activity that brought them uh, together. And there are many other French Romani families that, like his, remain today unforgotten film professionals of early cinema. I'm also thinking of Rosa Buglion, the well-known circus professional and wife of the legendary Sinti circus owner and performer Joseph Buglion. Rosa described in her own memoirs how in the 1920s her family performed, this time inside movie theaters. Film screenings often included an intermission at that time, during which Romani artists like Rosa and her family were invited to offer a performance to entertain the audience. At the same time, an actor, a screenwriter, a director and a producer, it is probably Charlie Chaplin who remains the biggest Hollywood star of Romani origins that we know. His granddaughters, Carmen and Dolores Chaplin, have been working on the documentary where they investigate their grandfather's uh, Romani origins and which, according to its producers, I quote, radically reinterprets Chaplin's work from a Romani perspective and examines the persecutions of uh, gypsies through his lens, unquote. It will be interesting to see how the Chaplin family reclaims its belonging to the Romani community because this is not necessarily something that Charlie Chaplin himself did during his lifetime. Quickly after rising to fame, speculations about Chaplin's uh, racial identity started to emerge. He was widely assumed to be Jewish and did little to correct the record. Perhaps maintaining the ambiguity around his origins was a way for Chaplin to protect himself in an American society obsessed with racial purity. Or perhaps it was easier for him to present himself as a citizen of the world, as, uh, as if he famously stated, rather than a British gypsy. His most memorable on-screen character, the Tramp, continues to make us laugh today. Often portrayed as a vagrant, the Tramp is an outsider, a man marginalized by society. Yet, he is never depicted as a loser. In fact, the Tramp came to be a huge star of the silent era. The audience loved this kind-hearted, clumsy Luna character, who strived to survive in a society where difference was constantly perceived negatively. Romani scholar Ian Hancock claims that Chaplin, I quote, modeled his tram character on his perceptions of Romani life, unquote. And it, it is easy to see how Chaplin's own experiences of marginalization as a child may indeed have inspired his work later in life. But in the film The Vagabond, written and directed by Chaplin in 1915, his famous hero gives us a different and in fact quite horrifying picture of Roma travelers. In the film, Chaplin's character meets a beautiful young girl, Edna, who was kidnapped and is now abused by a family of Roma. 
The tram comes to her rescue and helps her to run away. Two Romani characters are portrayed here. Eric Campbell, the chief of the gypsies, an extremely violent and brutish man, and an old lady who embodies the, this kind of stereotypical figure of the witch. She's mean, ugly, and even grotesque. Roma are portrayed as cruel, dirty, and civilized savages. But why would Chaplin contribute to the existing racist imagery that cinema had already managed to advertise on screen? Film scholars have underlined how in the United States, some production companies led by African-American filmmakers during the silent era, like the infamous Ebony Company, um, reproduced racist stereotypes in order to appeal to a white audience, simply because the white audience was considered to be the most profitable audience for film producers. Perhaps Chaplin felt that he was different enough. He certainly looked different enough for people to question his origins. He had a thick British accent that, you know, after the transition to talking films would be a problem to the star of silent cinema. Perhaps all he wanted was to make people laugh, even if that was at the expense of his own people and uh, secretly of himself. Perhaps he understood that a white audience would not show up at the movie theater if his film portrayed Roma people as multidimensional human beings. I'm not a cha Chaplin expert, so I'm not sure that I have a definitive answer to that question. But I still want to underline that Charlie Chaplin is the only filmmaker of that era who on screen saves Carmen, the famous tragic Kritana heroine who is killed by a spurn lover. The character of Carmen, who was born under the pen of French writer Prosper Mérimée, has appeared on screen as early as 1900. In his film, Burlesque and Garmin, Chaplin offers a hilarious parody of Cecil B. DeMille's Garmin, released the same year. The only difference here is that after being stabbed at the end of the film, Chaplin Scarman comes to life again, which is one of the rare times that a Romani uh, female character on screen can finally hope for a happy ending. If they have historically been placed at the margins of film history, Romani and Sinti women film pioneers such as Pisla and Stetter, Pilar Tavora or Marianne Spita have actively sought out to challenge stereotypical representations of Romani women found in mainstream white cinema since its beginning. In our next and final event, which will take place in Berlin during the Akidikia Film Festival, we will explore their legacy and question the cultural, political, artistic and economic challenges uh, still experienced by Romani and Sinti women filmmakers today. I will be joined by prominent female Romani film professionals to address these issues, so make sure to follow the Akidikian Film Festival online to receive all the information regarding this event. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I hope you enjoyed this second session. Festivalo Ake Dikea.